thank you very much for having me. When I was a boy, most of my friends were over 80. The reason for this was that my mother was a geriatric nurse. And so she'd often bring me along when we're going to a nursing home or for home health care. I would also often volunteer at whatever job she was doing. And you know, this would be you know, me actually trying to do entertainment at a local nursing home. That's my mother there in the, in the white. And uh, when entertainment would fall through, I'd have to uh, take the place, and so I'd end up playing saxophone for that day. But when we're doing home health care, my duties might include cleaning house or uh, helping people with their exercises. Now, after a traumatic medical event, like a stroke or spinal cord injury, rehab often helps these people maintain their independence. But it's very frustrating. It can be boring. It takes a long time. And the improvement is gradual. So oftentimes, people would forget to do them. Such was the case for Jack. Jack's stroke had left him mentally confused, and it affected his arm and leg, and so he had mobility issues. So he was told to do some rehabilitation exercises, but he would often forget them, sometimes willfully, or just do a small fraction of them. When I was there one-on-one -on -one with him, he would actually do it. I could see improvement. But when I wasn't there, his health would decline. Eventually, he'd have to enter a nursing home. This case is common. Rehabilitation exercises are often not followed. Compliance is as little as 25%. And also, it's very expensive. The sort of one-on-one -on -one treatment that I was doing as a volunteer is something that most of the people I work with could not afford. So insurance also tends to not cover it after a year. The improvement due to rehabilitation tends to decline over time. At least that's the common knowledge today. And insurance would say, well, if we're not getting much improvement and people don't want to do it after a year, why, why fund it? So when I was a teenager, even back then, I thought, if I could just spend more time with Jack, if there was a way that I could keep after him, or maybe we could make a rehabilitation exercise that just was part of his natural life, something he did normally. If we could make something that was cheap, something that was inexpensive that either he could afford or the insurance wouldn't mind paying for, maybe Jack would not have to go to a nursing home. 25 years later, we invented a technology that actually met these requirements, but I didn't realize it at the time. Let me introduce you to the passive haptic learning gloves. Haptic here just means tactile touch. And the idea was to create a pair of gloves that could teach you complex manual tasks without your active attention. Let me give you an example. Suppose you want to learn how to play a piano piece. We're talking about something simple like Beethoven's Ode to Joy or Amazing Grace. You would download the song you wanted into your cell phone and then play it over and over again. You'd hear it in your earphones. But as you heard it, these gloves would tap the finger that belongs to each note. So how does that work? Well, inside the glove is actually these little vibration motors. It's the same vibration motor that's in your cell phone. And all it does is as the song is played, it sends a little wireless signal to it and it taps the finger. And over time, after a lot of repetition, you get the muscle memory for that song. Now, to see if this would work, we tried an experiment. We had a piano in our lab, which could light each key as the song played. And so we'd bring participants in. They'd hear the music, see the keys light up, and feel it on their hands. And we'd do it once, play through the song once, then have them try to repeat the song. And of course, since we were recruiting non-musicians, they didn't do a very good job. Matter of fact, it was pretty awful. But we had an idea of how many errors they would make normally. And then we'd set them down, and they'd go do an examination, a reading comprehension exam. Now, this is graduate level work. They sit there and concentrate on this exam for, for half an hour. And meanwhile, the song's playing over and over in their head and tapping their fingers. And they come back, and they try the song again. And oftentimes, they could play it through with no mistakes. Now, I'm not saying we made musicians out of them. In fact, their rhythm was often very poor. But what we did give them was the ability to have that muscle memory, that sequence of notes. So they got the keys right. That was very exciting. The idea that we could actually teach this complex manual task of a piano melody without your active attention. Wow, do we really believe that? And I didn't at first. When my grad student came back and said, hey, it worked. Look, perfect results. 
He's like, you're kidding. No, that can't be, it can't be right. Let's do it again. So we did it five times with three different sets of grad students on two different continents. We always got the same result. It works. We tried different distraction tasks. We had people do math questions, memory games, watch videos, read their email. The best one was a scavenger hunt. We thought the actual motion of the body would mask the effect of the, of the glove, and they wouldn't pick it up. But every time, people improved their ability at playing piano. In fact, we discovered that you didn't even need the audio. You just turn off the audio and just have it tap your fingers, and it would work. Amazing. So eventually, we got very bold. We got brave, and we decided we're going to tell the world about this. We decided to do it on live TV. Now, as a scientist, this is something you don't do. <laughs> live demos almost always go badly. So let me introduce you to Chad. He's a meteorologist. He has no musical skill whatsoever. He will tell you this himself in a second. And let me just show you what happens. For 45 minutes, and what was the song, by the way? Oh, it's did you it's oh, it's we're taking the glove off here. Oh, this ought to be good. <laughs> All right, Ted. Okay. And he gets nervous. He manages in front of 20 million people. <laughs> and at all pauses I did, and goes, oh, my word, this is not going to work. My mouse. Okay. I did he's my been You're doing all the things. tracking the hurricane for 45 minutes. Muslim he's put the glove on. He's been busy. Right? And now, you can see him go. He's this grid oh, cop. Are you kidding me? He goes, oh, my word, this is working. Are you kidding me? My hand is possessed. Now, do you have I notice he's not even looking. Music, ever play right? the piano? <laughs> And you didn't sitting know that here, song, right? thinking, no, I, this is not no, working, I and then he starts playing, <laughs> and he realizes his hand knows what to do. Back and forth. No, I was hoping and for then like as he plays, he realizes, <laughs> oh, I know this song. Watch, watch, watch. It should Clearly go like this. It, it, his it, musicality gets middle, better middle, every time up, he repeats down, it. Down, 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 down. So, thank you. And so after doing that, we got lots of calls, and we started trying to figure out what we do next, what other manual skills could we do? And one that got our attention was Braille. 50% of children who are blind or low vision are considered non-readers. In other words, they get their text through books on tape or through screen readers on computers. But that means they never learn how to spell. They never learn how to do grammar. They have a hard time writing. And matter of fact, that correlates to educational level later. Braille literacy directly correlates to education level and job placement. And so this is considered a crisis in the community. They want to teach more people how to learn Braille so they get that sort of literacy they need to advance themselves. Now, Braille is a relatively simple system. It just consists of six dots, and they represent the letters. You type it using a keyboard like this. There's only three keys on each hand that really matter. You type it with your index, middle, and your ring finger. But you hit them all at once, like a chord, like on a guitar. And that actually types the letter. And you can do quite quickly at this. And that creates the, the raised embossed letters that you see. So we decided to see if we could use the same procedure we used to teach piano to teach the Braille alphabet. This is our setup. We used one of these one-handed keyboards we had in our, in our lab to make the system. And what we did is we had people learn a pangram. A pangram is a phrase that has all the letters in the alphabet. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So now instead of hearing the audio and, playing the, and, and feeling the tapping on their, their fingers for the notes, here they're hearing first two words, the quick, T, tap, tap, H, tap, 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 E, tap, tap. And as it spells out the first two words, um, they do this over and over again. And then I move to the next two words, brown fox, etc. They do this for 10 minutes at a time. And then we test them on the phrase. And what was exciting is that in four hours, all but one of our test participants learned how to type Braille. This was very exciting. You know, now, of course, they didn't know how to type Braille in the beginning because they didn't get all the letters until the end. But because these phrases have repeated letters, they learn quickly. Matter of fact, many of them learned how to type the alphabet before the end of the test session. We also tested them on another phrase. Let's see if I can remember it. When zombies attack, quickly facts judge Pete. 
and they did that perfectly as well. But the real shocker was the fact that these people could not only type Braille, they could read it. We could show them a picture of a Braille cell and say, what is this letter? They'd sit there and think, okay, I type it with these fingers and these fingers. Oh yes, that's the letter G. Okay, what's this letter? That's the letter H. We'd also test them by taking a Braille cell, a one that's actually raised as you feel, and put it underneath a box. And they'd have to reach in the box and tell us what the letter was. And again, they could do it. Now in four hours, passively, we've actually trained people how to both type Braille and read Braille. That's pretty amazing. And we were, we were all excited about this, and we were telling everybody, because we had seen nobody else in the literature describe this sort of effect. And now we're trying to think of, you know, can we use the, teach people how to dance, or how to do other complex tasks. And we're showing this at an open house at my university, when a colleague comes up to us and says, hi, you know, I do am head of rehab at a local spinal cord center. I would really like to use your technology to help my patients with tetraplegia. This caused me to pause. Why would you teach people who are paralyzed how to play piano? And she saw my confusion and said, no, no, Thad, you, you're, you don't understand. Tetraplegia just means all four limbs are affected. The people I work with have partial spinal cord breaks or have damage in the spinal cord. And they still have some sensation, some dexterity. So she introduced to me somebody like Rick. Rick became paralyzed after a, an infection due to an epidural injection. He used to be a high-level logistics manager at a major company. Uh, now, he still does email, but he does it with one finger. If he hurts himself, if he hurts his hand, he might not notice it, and that can be very dangerous. So the question is, can we help somebody like Rick improve the sensation in his hand? The idea is that if, as we have the glove tap their fingers, it would actually cause the brain to recruit more and more neurons to explain the signal coming up from their hands through the spinal cord, through the damaged section, and into the brain, and try to model what's going on. So we set out on an experiment. We were trying to teach people eight songs over eight weeks. And we had two conditions. These, these are 10 hands we're testing. The control condition was just normal piano lessons, like you might use on one of these you know, automatic synthesizer pianos. And what happens is they go in for 30 minutes a week, Three, uh, 30 minutes at a session, three times a week, and they'd see the piano, play a song, and they'd try to repeat it. The experimental group, they'd do the same thing, but they'd add to that wearing the glove for five times a week for at least two hours. They did this while they're doing other things, like reading email or watching videos. We knew we had something when one of our early test participants came in and gave us the finger. He came in waving his middle finger at us and saying, look what I can do. <laughs> We're like, well, that's very nice, but we really should get back to practicing the piano. No, no, you don't understand. This is a major life improvement for me. I've been waiting for years to flip off my physical therapist. <laughs> yes, that's very good, but we should get back to it. No, no, you still don't get it. I'm serious. When I came in here, my hands were clawed up. I couldn't articulate my fingers separately. Now I can. Another thing that told us we were on to something is when a, when a grandfather, who was, happened to be one of our early participants, came in and said, I want to learn how to play happy birthday for my grandson. He's seven, I want to play for, for him by the end of the week. And we're like, well, we can probably do that. We quickly programmed the glove for him, and that's the song he learned that week. And he could indeed play it for his grandson. And we had this aha moment. This is meaningful for these people beyond rehab. This is a new skill, and they're viewing it as a new skill. So here's the clinical results. On the left hand, on, on left hand side, we actually have the improvement for people without the glove. Now, red means an actual decline in sensation. Green means improvement in sensation. The, the more green it is, the more improvement there is. So as you can see on the left hand side, we get sort of the, the mix of, of improvements you'd expect, and there's no real, nothing really happening. On the right hand side are the improvements for our people with the glove. And you can see we get improvements across the hand. In rehabilitation, especially hand sensation, there's actually a graph that shows the different stages of sensation. Loss of protective sensation is when you might hurt yourself and not realize it. And that ranges all the way up through diminished light touch to normal. And these arrows indicate the amount of improvements our participants had. 
we actually had people cross boundaries. We had people who came in and they couldn't feel the heat of the coffee on their hand, at least not for a long time. Now they could tell if they're burning themselves. We had somebody who came in not being able to dress himself or having a lot of trouble with it, went out buttoning his own buttons. And how about Rick? Rick started typing with multiple fingers and he could actually tell if he actually hurt himself. Now, let me show you the last session with Rick. He gave permission for me to show this. This is him playing one of the songs. So I'm not saying he has full articulation. He doesn't. But he is using all five fingers on that hand to play that song. And he did see a significant improvement in eight weeks. Now when I think about it, back about Jack, I wonder if he had this glove, would it have kept him out of the nursing home? Would it have made learning fun for him? Could it have been on his hand so it would automatically give these rehab effects? But more importantly, would he have loved it? Would he have actually done it no matter what? Would insurance have covered it? Would it have been good enough that he would do it no matter what insurance said? But for me, one of the most encouraging things is when our participants started saying that it's not just rehab, it's about learning a new life skill. Thank you very much.